come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a weekly movie talk show that goes around the room and we pick movies and we watch them and it's all for your entertainment. We hope that you enjoy what you're listening to here. If you do, do us a favor. All for and you, go- Damien. <laughs> all for you. We all hope that uh, if you do like what you hear, why don't you go on over to wherever you found us and hit that like or subscribe button. All that stuff helps us get found by other folks like you as we uh, you know, are getting closer to our goal of total world domination. These are the Internet Radio Superstars. Holly. Michaela. Sean. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by Michaela. Michaela, what did we watch tonight? We watched Wishmaster. Ooh, you have to say it like that, too. Like, <laughs> Wishmaster. <laughs> From the year. 1997. Jesus. I thought it was earlier, it's, honestly. It feels it older. It felt earlier. Yeah. It felt when older. I, yeah, when I, pulled the, it up on, when I pulled it up on Prime, I was like, is that right? Is, is this right? the right one? You're like, was that when they released like a remaster of yeah, it? That's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the 30 year remaster they released in 1997. Right. Let's watch that. No, it looked old at the beginning, but then it settled into its 90sness. I think. I oh, think yeah. by old, I mean like early 90s. Like if you would have told me this was 91, I would have been like, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying, because all those 90s movies uh, share like a similar aesthetic. I mean, I don't know if it's film stocks or lenses or lighting packages or whatever, but they all kind of look the same. But this one almost kind of feels in some way like it's at the end of an era of uh, in horror. Um, This being both practical effects horror and it's like this is the horror movie all star uh, movie, (laughs) right? Oh, well, who directed this movie? Robert Kurtzman, the K of K and B effects. And uh the B, uh what's his name? Burger. Um yeah. oh crap. Is it Matt Burger? No, what's He's his name? I can never remember his name. Uh <laughs> I know the other two. I can never I have, remember. I have never known. Oh crap. <laughs> I forget it's burger sometimes. Yeah, it's gonna come back to me. It's I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, and then there's Nick, Greg Nicotero, obviously, who's uh yeah. you know, he's gone on to become a director now. He's uh the showrunner on The Walking Dead, and uh he's also got the creep show show on Shutter. Um, but all these guys were uh I, and still are, I think Titans in the, uh, practical makeup. Of, I mean, they basically, basically are Hollywood's go-to crew for practical makeup effects. Even now, if you need a physical like dead Buffalo or something in your movie, uh, you call KNB. Oh yeah. Robert like Kurtzman like worked Howard. on Dr. Sleep. It's Howard. Howard Burger. Thank you very much. Oh, Holly. that's right. That's yeah. Right. I like how you went to Dead Buffalo, Colin. It's just like, that's something yeah, you want to see was, in a movie? No, it was because of uh, Dances with Wolves. They did Dances with Wolves. Oh. Uh, not a movie you would associate with a practical makeup effects crew, but sure. I remember I mean, reading a Fangoria article. Somebody was in their shop, and there was like a whole bunch of dead buffalo in their <laughs> shop. And like, what's that for? Oh, we're doing Dances with Wolves. Like, okay. So, I mean, even stuff that you don't assume right would be a makeup effects thing they're there um this movie is presented by wes craven that's right now sir wes craven if they die can we give them a sir is that no england has that authority not us what what do we we can bestow it upon them no we are not british wes craven esquire (laughs) i mean what do you want there Yeah. yeah Um, the, legendary. The, the yeah, well, the is all we have to put in there. Well, I think you got to go with he's the Maven of horror, Wes Craven, right? The Maven. You got the Duke. You got the Master. Did you just go for you, that for the Maven? The, we're gonna we're gonna Craven. start it right. The Maven. He's the oh. Maven. We'll just call him the Maven from now on. It's Wes Craven. Maven. I'm of not horror. on board this train. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, so Wes Craven, um, his name being on the movie, I think uh, got a lot of people to see it in 1997 because Wes Craven was coming off the smash hit that was. Scream. People under the stairs. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Previous episode. Jesus. Do you we're, see the, we're a little Jordan frustrated Peele? on that one. You see Jordan Peele is developing a remake. Of course he is. It's a horror movie with black people in it. Of yeah. course he's going to re- reboot God. it. Yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, Pigeonhole. I, mean, I was gonna say, but this one isn't as insulting because I'm like, maybe he'll make it good. I don't know. I mean, oh. that's true. Like, I mean, I'm like still not interested stage? in seeing it, but that movie sucks. That movie was boring as hell. I can't remember. We'll have to go back. I'll go oh, back we and were, listen to our, our episode on it. Yeah. yeah. Um. So Wes Craven at this point in time was coming off a of scream, and I think as Sean said, uh, that made him the household name in horror, and so he got to slap his name on a series of Wes Craven Presents movies. Anybody remember what the other ones were? They? Yeah. Well, that was the yeah. worst. That was uh, yeah. one of the worst <laughs> movies I've ever seen in a movie theater was Wes Craven Presents They. They. Uh, yeah. A Don't horrible, rem- horrible I, movie. I know I saw it. I don't remember it. Well, he was also Wes Craven Presents Dracula 2000. Do you remember uh, uh, the Gerard uh, Butler I do remember that movie. Yeah, which is, I'm sure is, I should admit to. That's coming to the, the Saturday Night Freak Show at some point, I'm sure. Oh, Patrick Lucier. <laughs> did Patrick Lucier it's direct that coming. one? Yeah, because Patrick Lucier <laughs> was uh, Wes Craven's editor on Scream yeah. and had worked with him on a couple things. So that was his directorial debut. So Wes Craven slaps his name on this thing. And then uh, I think based on the power of that name alone was able to garner the amount of uh, horror movie talent for this movie. This is uh, before we even start talking about the movie itself. This is like a horror. All st- it's like an in joke, not an in joke. It's like a party for horror fans of this uh, era, right? Or this yeah. kind of closes on an era. Um, who do we have represented in this movie? Can you go down the list of luminaries that are in this? I mean, there's two people from Phantasm in this movie. That's right. It's true. Who do you got? That's where the top of the list starts for me. (laughs) (laughs) So you got Angus Scrim and Reggie Bannister. Angus Scrim is a narrator at the very beginning of the movie. Uh, Reggie Bannister shows up as a, uh, he's a a convenience store owner. No, he's a pharmacy, pharmacist. Pharmacist. Um, You've also got who else? Tony Todd. The great Tony Todd, Candy Man, appears Tony as Todd. a uh, a doorman. Um, Kane Hodder's in this. Robert England, Kane Hodder. Robert England, I think, has the most screen time. He's the guy responsible of bringing the Wishmaster to American Shores. Uh, Ted Raimi is uh, also uh, squashed by a, 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 a crate in the very first <laughs> scene that he's in. That was we've, great. <laughs> we've got uh, Buck George Buck Flower from uh, all the John Carpenter movies. He's in this. Hell yeah! <clears throat> um, Shockingly, playing a homeless man. I know no one saw that coming. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's got, poor guy's typecast, and here he like doesn't have his fake teeth in. So you know, it's like yeah. wow, really um, went for it. Now I'm totally blanking out, but we saw other folks in this movie that uh, we had so. the. The, the old woman like from said, Devil. Uh, she wasn't famous for for <laughs> no. But I kept watching this movie, going, "Where the fuck is she from? What the fuck is she from? What I think horror her name's Jenny I O'Hara. Yep, Jenny yeah. O'Hara. I had to look her up, but I'm like, where? Yeah, where is she from, Sean? I'm glad that you were using your mental acuity. I cheated and went to the IMDb because I'm like, damn it, uh, where is that movie era woman from? Um, yep. So we've also got behind the scenes, uh, we've got Harry Manfredini uh, doing the music for this. He's obviously the guy who did all the Friday the 13th movie scores. Um, and got, then took them and slapped them onto different movies. Like this one. With no shame. Yep. And just added more noise, I guess. Made it more noisy. Like, uh, Is Harry Manfredini, this is what I keep coming back to, is like, is he a good movie composer? No. no. He got lucky once. His Friday the Thirteenth movie it's scores. Variations on a theme now. Well, if you go, if you listen to the Friday the Thirteenth movie scores, I think are in some way not as iconic as uh, the John Carpenter Halloween stuff, right? We're saying Friday the Thirteenth comes from that lineage that was started by uh, uh, Halloween. But those scores with, uh, I guess they're psych. It's a riff on Psycho, right? With all the strings yeah. and all that stuff, but though that's those scores separate those movies from like the rest of the slasher movie. A copycats that came out around that time um but then harry manfredini once he uh, met uh electronic uh you know synthesizers it all goes to <laughs> shit no going know? back yeah there's no going back and his stuff is bad <laughs> he clearly had like a religious experience when he found out that he could incorporate electronics because it just wasn't the same after that <laughs> 
Yeah, I think because I just, uh, you know, I mean, he did stuff like uh, uh, House. You know, I liked the score for House. That was okay. Yeah. It was a little bit of Electronica, then uh, Deep Star 6, you know, very melodic. And then it had some Electronica. But I think by the time he got to Jason Goes to Hell, like that's one of the worst scores I've ever heard in my life. And this is cut from that cloth where a phone ringing gets you, ding, ding, ding you know, uh, repeatedly in this movie it's like uh he's just on the nose if this if it's supposed to be scary <laughs> cat jumps out of something harry manfredini is going to give it a stinger right there um and i uh i think it's jock jock hatekin uh cinematographer of a nightmare on elm street the first one did did this movie um and robert kurtzman obviously directed so I mean, I had comparisons, I guess. I was thinking of Pumpkinhead a little bit because we talked about, pump, you know, Stan Winston. Um, he was an effects guy who became a director. And, uh, you know, the first choice of a, a, a makeup effects guy when they have an opportunity to go make a movie, it's like, well, you're going you're gonna to make a movie that's a special effects filled script. Yeah. Right. Do they ever make uh, romantic comedies? Does that ever happen? Like when they get this opportunity, it's always <laughs> horror movies, right? Well, we haven't seen a no main, a no named Norm, the uh, Stan Winston second movie, right? Who knows what that's all about? I mean, I'm gonna guess. <laughs> uh, Kurtzman uh, eventually went on to do some action flicks. I think. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Low budget. Anything that didn't involve movie. blood spurting out, like anything at all. Yeah. Like it's a romantic comedy, but the groom loses an arm in the first 10 minutes. I'm I guessing that's so. what happened. Uh, this movie's also written by a guy, a guy named uh, Peter Atkins. Peter Atkins, we will all know as the scribe uh, of Hellraiser 2. Uh, all Hellbound. the Hellraiser sequels. Okay, so I am not surprised. I was, I was looking that up. Did he do? Because I know he did. Uh, he did uh, two. He did three. He did Hellraiser Bloodlines. Did he keep going after that, or was it all he's, like a he's credit? credited on them? So I, who knows? It might be like a characters by thing. Think, but he is yeah. credited on every Hellraiser sequel. Yeah. Do you feel it's a nice check? Is there a crossover uh, between? Um, yes. Okay. This is Definitely. the this better is version of a Hellraiser movie, in my opinion. What? This is, what, what? Yeah, yeah, you might be right. What, what? Yeah, I, this is. I mean, you get some serious. This, this feels like Hellraiser when they're 3. when they're when they're in that like paper mache tunnel. There's some serious Hellraiser vibes yeah. in that moment. Like, oh, yeah, there's serious. tons of Hellraiser yeah. in this movie. It's Hellraiser and Freddy. Yeah, but you're saying okay. Well, that's another. We got to set the the stage. Right. Is like this is 1997, and we're desperately in Hollywood horror, looking for the next Freddy Krueger. Right? We've already oh. gone through. Uh, um, well, Candyman is out by now, right? That's why Tony mm-hmm. Todd gets a, a a shout out in this movie. Um, did we say Kane Hodder's in this movie? I think we did. Kane Hodder's in the yeah, movie. Yeah, like Sean mentioned. Um, he's a security guard. Um, we've already had do anybody remember brain scan with the trickster who's supposed to be the next freddy krueger the edward furlong movie oh Never dear god it. in heaven well now i really don't want to watch it so. <laughs> oh you said all the wrong words is that time. kid riding a bike screaming for his mom yeah I think he's, he lost me at furlong it's slightly <laughs> older edward furlong so okay so what are we looking for when we say that we're and and this is obviously the 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 bad guy in, in wishmaster shares this what what do you see as the appeal of Freddy Krueger that they're like trying to capitalize on? Uh, a, a devious, a playfulness, a playful deviousness, I would say. You know, a, a personality is what they're looking for. They want, and, this, you know, something to get them through their movie anyway. And he like has this like way of kind of like manipulating reality, you know, and, mm-hmm. and mm. kind of like taking your words and uh, twisting them around on you, you know? Yeah. He's very quippy. Mm-hmm. It's very leprechaunish in that way. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that was another one. Obviously, Leprechaun was uh, another movie where they were trying to create a Freddy Krueger uh, franchise bad guy. Wishmaster actually, I guess, succeeded because, yeah. uh, you know, there were four of these fucking movies. <laughs> if you can believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it made, but it only cost $5 million to make. So it made $15 million, So it was it was a hit. <coughs> not bad yeah because it opened i think uh like third place or something what no it was the first place of the weekend i came on i can't remember but i mean and obviously it went people, up against the game yeah i don't remember that being all that well received either the david Fincher <laughs> yeah. movie 
Um, now I don't think anybody remembers that. Da- oh yeah, David Fincher, the game, that and Panic Room, right? They're the two that slipped through the cracks. When <laughs> you think Absolutely. of the David Fincher uh, filmography, it got, it got his it got he got his Criterion release. Yeah, I know. I like the movie, so, but I'll uh, see. Yeah. I don't see how you get it for the game and not like Zodiac, but whatever. Benjamin whatever, Buttons on Criterion? That doesn't That's deserve really, it. Very true. <laughs> Benjamin fucking Button. Fuck that movie. <laughs> Is anyone going to sit down and be like, you know what? I want to watch three hours of Benjamin Button again. No, Nobody does. You saw Nobody once. does. But you know what I watch over and over? Zodiac. All yeah. the time. Watch exactly. it all but Benjamin Button five years ago? I have not watched it. You hmm. bought it? Of course you bought it. Yeah, it was $5 movie. on Black Friday. <laughs> I don't care. You might as well. You might as well have taken it directly to disc replay. I mean, kind of. Yeah. Well, we're surprised <laughs> it hasn't made it there yet. Uh, so, Wishmaster, heavily influ- influenced by both uh, Hellraiser and Freddy Krueger. Hellraiser, in that a lot of the dialogue that comes out of the gin. Uh, who's our primary antagonist in this movie? Sounds like stuff that maybe Pinhead would say. Yeah, right. he's talking. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very sadistic and uh, euphemisms. An eternal, you know, I am an eternal evil child. You know, is that? Uh, That's pretty mm-hmm. compelling. That was decent. Yeah. Okay, uh, I was gonna. I don't, try. I don't have the. I don't have the phlegm in my throat to pull it off right now. So I, I could have done it one. last week. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you need. Yeah, you need that, Holly. <laughs> Do you guys like how he exaggerates every syllable? Like, did you notice he says, instead of saying jewel, he says jewel. Jewel. Yeah. (laughs) The jewel. Give me your jewel. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, This is uh, Andrew Divoff, I think is his name. Uh, He's a Russian uh, actor who was born in Venezuela. And uh, I saw him first in a movie called Toy Soldiers, where he was a terrorist. he's, he's He's a Russian actor that was born in Venezuela? Right. Uh, yeah. So he he didn't grow up there. No. Oh, I don't know if he grew right. up there. He may have. Gr- yeah, know. he may have grown up in Venezuela, but is a, of Russian nationality. Spoke multiple languages. Uh, oh, interesting. Which is and, which is why he is a terrorist in every single every movie. movie. Yes. he's not which master. Every single oh. movie. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Toy Soldiers was Die Hard in a private school. He was the bad guy. He was also. Toy in, Soldiers uh, is great. It is. Way, oh, seen so that. you've seen it. I've seen oh, it, yeah. but Toy I haven't Soldiers seen it in a long great. time. Okay, all right, yeah. That's, that's a thought, great movie. I thought Toy, Toy Soldiers was getting overlooked here, but okay. I think it is by most of the general public, but I like it. It's good. Well, we'll also remember him as the primary antagonist of another 48 hours. Ah, He's in Air oh. Force One, too. He is. He's in Lost. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. He had the eye patch. Was it the eye patch in, in Lost? I anyway. watched Lost. Um, so Andrew Devoff is playing an Arab, uh, boogeyman. So a gin, what's a gin? Help me out here. It's like basically a Middle Eastern evil genie for the, for the most part. I looked up mm-hmm. a little bit and it actually predates Islam. So this is like a piece of folklore that goes back a really long time. Mm-hmm. If you watch, if you watch Supernatural, you're familiar with the gin. <laughs> This is like the, uh, so is this the uh, Arabic version of um, like a demon? Uh, kind yes of. Yes and no. Yeah. Like from what I was reading, they're not inherently good or evil. Yeah. This like a trickster. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. The gin, uh, we angelicized it, it became genie, I think it was like plural. The genie became genie in uh that was uh sir richard burton's 1001 arabian nights right the aladdin and his magic lamp is that the name of the thing is that the original story i can't remember but yeah. uh, uh but so this was like okay we're gonna go the back Ali to Baba? the Alibaba. is that the one is it in well, the that's a different thieves? story Isn't that's that a different original? story yeah that's in that's in 1001 uh arabian nights Ooh. did that's you know one of the 1001 stories yeah did yeah. you know that right now the one story that uh, Michaela probably found this in her research because she probably looked up in the same place I did that right now, in modern day, apparently in Morocco, about 86% of the people who live there believe in genies. Today. Have they seen one? That's cool. Well, because it's wanna, a, all right, genie, genie, genie. genie. That's what I'm saying. It's a, a huge cultural thing. Don't see. I mean, it, it makes sense. Have you seen pictures of Morocco? It's beautiful. There's got to be. <laughs> I need a, there. Yeah, I need a genie <laughs> documentary right now. Someone needs to talk to these people. Well, yeah. ironically, I was actually going to follow up uh, with this uh, with you guys and see if any of you have seen the movie Gin. Uh, it was Toby Hooper's final movie. 
Uh, He was contracted by, uh, I think it was Abu Dhabi, it was the United Arab Emirates, right? We're trying to get into horror movies. Uh, And so they hired, of course, the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This is like 2016 or something like that, right? To come over and make this movie about uh, an evil djinn. Uh, I haven't seen it. I saw the trailer for it. Uh, It was delayed many times because I guess it ran into problems with the religious uh you know censorship boards or whatever that it was you know about evil and fairies and gin and all this pretty stuff. Intense censorship over there yeah so it really i don't know if it ever really came out i mean you can watch it it's on amazon prime and it, it is toby hooper's uh final final film i believe Interesting. uh gin so there you go and guess who did the makeup effects candy you are correct. Well, Robert Kurtzman, yeah, did the makeup okay. effects for uh, okay. Jen. Um, okay, so that lays the kind of the groundwork. So what what do we have going on in this movie? What uh, for, this movie starts off at cranked up to eleven. Oh. <laughs> it is a smorgasbord of gore in the first like three minutes. So what happens? It's a fantastic there? cold open. It's wonderful. Uh, this guy is really generic with the gin and you have to be really specific with this guy because it's it's the words you say make things happen and what does he say like astound me gin show me your power or something show me amazing extent, things right? or something like that this is in yeah. uh like 10th century persia right yep and he basically says dealer dealer's choice yeah as you wish and boom away we go and there's all sorts of grotesque uh elaborate makeup effects like right out of the fucking gate because this is a it movie is directed by a makeup effects maestro <laughs> and away we go and then i was sitting there going like oh man this is one of those situations where a warning sign warning sign it's like are you going to be able to maintain this you know if you start off yeah. that you know how are you going to top this uh later on <laughs> Uh, I mean, your impressions of this scene, right? So, I mean, are are you legitimately like this is a, you know, um, hell yeah, okay, this is a, a fucking skeleton got out of a body, Colin. <laughs> yeah, a skeleton walked out of a body and jumped on another yeah, guy. Literally that's, shed its own skin. Just I think that's emerged. like on my wish amazing. list. We, Pretty we don't high have skeletons in movies. That was amazing. Yeah, moving skeletons. I love skeletons because there's a little bit bodies. of they use uh, they use the old puppeteering uh, thing uh, stop motion for the puppet. Mm. Um, there's also a, a lot of CG in this movie, and it's not good CG. It's that 1997s era really bad CG. It's a PlayStation Two CG. Yeah, but it's yeah. mixed because obviously they couldn't afford to do everything with it like you can now. So there's a lot of practical Thankfully. makeup effects. <laughs> so what do you generally in the movie? I mean, there's a lot of practical effects. I mean, how did, how did you think they rated? Really good. They were gross. awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, it was, yeah. It was a really gross movie, but you know, in a good way. Everything was wet. Yeah, yeah. everything yeah, was sticky very, and slimy very wet and, and sticky, and it's all uh, yeah, fluid, it's all it's all twisty. Fluid. <laughs> it's good. It's good stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty good. It's, uh, you know, I, I've been, uh, this is a thing that I've been wrestling with. Like, why don't I like, you know, like I like movies that have CG in them, obviously. I mean, now we've gotten to a point where CG does look very photorealistic and, you know, but there's a sense I always have when I watch it, when you see somebody get shot and like a, you know, blood spray and you can tell that it's a digital blood spray and you're like, oh, okay. They just filmed it, you know, one way and then we'll add it in post, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. There, I still- think I, but I think I've narrowed it down. I think I know what the appeal of practical effects is. Cause you're going to have people who are always going to go like, well, what, you know, what's the appeal of practical? I don't get it. You know, it's like that we can do stuff that looks a lot better and moves better now and has better facial, you know, uh, effects. I think what it is for me is it's, uh, e- there's a feeling that you're watching a live magic show, right? That these guys are pulling off makeup effects illusions. Like they're on the floor, right on the, on the stage floor. They're doing it for real. And it's some kind of makeup effects thing where you're seeing a guy shed his own skin and sit up out, you know, the skeleton sits up out of a guy, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You can do that easily now in CG, but like it's, it's impressive even now to watch, you know, that happen right in front of your face, you know, in the, in the first five minutes of this movie, you know? Yeah. I think that was why it has such an effect or you're, you're just not like, okay, there's, you know, yeah, everything's exploding everywhere. And 
skeletons are getting up and it's like, man, they actually did that. When Robert Englund throws mm-hmm. up this uh, tentacled creature later yeah. on and late in the movie, it's like, that's actually there. Like he's attached to this thing that's laying on the to floor. The mouth, man. I was thinking <laughs> that about that. Was I was gross. like, how many days did, did Robert Englund spend like kneeling on the floor with this thing attached to his mouth? Yeah, that's hours. That's a yeah. couple day thing right there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he's probably like old hat at this point. Yeah. Well, he's he, like, I get to do it without being underneath three hours of makeup? Fine. Hook yeah. that thing up to my face. I'll suck on it all day. Yeah, because this Don't is in the, uh, the area of the era where Robert Englund was kind of doing, flexing his acting muscle by uh, appearing out of Freddy makeup in a bunch of other movies, including uh, one I believe we did the first urban legend on this show. Mm. Right, Indeed. we did do it. You, you, you not remember? Has it turned into Urban Legend itself? I thought it was maybe Urban Legend Two. I couldn't remember no, which one it was. Uh, yeah. I see your confusion. Yeah, well, like we, we did one of the yeah because it oh. was probably bought by brought by Sean, and you know odds are it was the second one. Um, <laughs> all right, so when yeah, you cover that it? free space in your <laughs> Saturday Night Freak Show bingo, fine. <laughs> uh, Michaela, why don't you set us up with what's the plot? What's what's happening? What's the story driver of this movie? Once we cut to the modern, well, how how do we get the gin, the threat from uh, you know uh, the, the Middle Ages? Uh, that could be wrong. Uh, from 10th century Persia, how do we get that to modern day uh, Los Angeles? So the jewel that houses the gin <laughs> is put inside of a statue that is being brought to Robert England on a crate off a ship. <laughs> And the person operating the crane to pull this crate off the ship off off the ship is straight up pouring a bunch of liquor into his morning coffee while he's operating it. Did he pour that whole flask in there? I don't think so. I think it was just a quick little pour. Oh, oh, quick! That's another horror movie. Uh, call it. That's Joe Pilato from uh, Day of the Dead. He's the asshole military dude who's yelling at everybody in Day of the Dead. Oh, nice. Mm. Yeah, Sam. I didn't even recognize him. I saw him in the credits. I'm like, oh shit! It's Joe Pilato. Yeah. And uh, he's fucking around and uh, because he's wasted at like 9 a.m. on a work day and drops this crate right on Ted Raimi. Oh, that's right. Ted Raimi's in this movie. Well, we said that. Uh, yeah. So um, and and then the uh, well, OK, so there's a there's a, a mythology, right, that, that the movie establishes that we have to, you know, set up so that this thing can pay off uh, in this cold open. The idea that a genie has to grant three wishes um, to the person who summoned or awakened the genie, right? Three wishes to that person. And on the third wish, once that's completed, according to the mythology that we find out throughout the movie in the detective story where our lead character has to find out what's going on here, uh, if a genie grants a third wish, then all the other djinn can enter uh, from the spaces between worlds and come into our plane of existence and take over apocalypse right basically it's coming yeah and so he gets uh the wise old vizier in the 10th century is able to like you know you're not gonna go and put that you know do make that third wish we're gonna put him in a ruby and it's an opal sorry uh, red opal and the opal gets uh, encased in this statue and when the thing drops on sam or ted Raimi, it breaks open and a dock worker finds it and mischief ensues because what do you do when you find a priceless gem upon it exactly yeah. i mean i'd probably do this too oh i was well as soon as he took it i was like well he's got a pawn it because what is he gonna do go to the black market nobody knows how to do that he got a yeah. pawn it yeah yep this leads, of course, to uh, eventually it gets uh, comes to the attention of a uh, a dealer who has to recruit Tammy Lauren, who probably just me will remember from uh, the TV sequel to the Stepford Wives, which was called the Stepford Children. Oh, no. She was one of the kids wow. who moved to the town of Stepford, where it turns out they start doing the wives. They had all them. And they started doing the kids too. Bam. That's not, don't, Sean's going <laughs> to bring that now. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't do that. Um, so, the- so Tammy Lauren is, uh, I'm not sure like what she's a gemologist. I'm making shit up here. What? <laughs> I, they may have said they that. They did say that word in this movie. They did. Use I, th- it. I think they said it in a, uh, uh, facetious way because yeah. they didn't know the fucking word, but gemologist. Yeah. 
Okay. So she's going to she's going to inspect the thing to find out what its value is and in doing so she finds out that living inside the thing she actually has a she, somehow okay so the the gin lives in a little uh red halloween uh tunnel uh enclosure what what are we yeah, saying it's like a this cheap is? ass haunted house tunnel that he lives in <laughs> yes where he sits on a throne and presides over the uh the torture of it's, souls that are in there it's like one of those Blow, those circus blow up things where they stick the fan on and then you can go in and walk through and all that. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of what it feels like. And yeah. he has like a turtle dinosaur that's like his pet, I guess. <laughs> hey, if you're a gin, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Yeah, so you pick turtle dinosaur? <laughs> that's yeah, a scene. and it's it's like the size of Yoshi in the Super Mario Brothers movie. It's not very big. Uh, no. Yeah, but it's a, it's a creature. It feels like torn directly from uh, Hellraiser. Hellraiser, you know, the thing that chases Kirsty down the tunnel. It's like, imagine yep. that. It's the same scene eventually, you know. Yeah. Somebody, um, mm-hmm. So he lives in there. She has some kind of psychic vision because she breathes on it and then rubs it, you know, against she's trying to clean it. She rubs it on her. Yeah, like you rub a lamp. Yeah. yeah. And boom, that means he is linked to her. And so sure enough, uh, there's a big explosion at the lab when they shoot lasers at the thing. And this, uh, well, actually, the gin, when he first appears, he appears as like a, a, a little baby gin. Do you know this who played, is... the, do you know who played oh. little baby gin? Who? Vern, Vern Troyer. Of oh, course lights. he did. <laughs> this is this killed me. This is the this is the worst part about this movie. <laughs> what the baby have, gin? Those, oh my god! Have little Vern Vern Troyer baby eyes crawling over towards you. This was the goofiest <laughs> shit. Oh my god! I just couldn't stop looking at its like arms. It had like guns. It was like little like right? red baby gin. It's a buff forty five year old man <laughs> stuck in a tiny Vern Troyer body. <laughs> so this is where the, the but the mythology then it starts to crack here a little bit because I'm like okay so a genie comes out of a bottle and basically you have to you get three wishes but right here we're establishing uh, so the gin needs a soul basically to kind of get his uh, physical form back or at least you know uh, grow into a, a humanoid right and so uh, the lab technician that's there he offers to grant him a wish in exchange for his soul, right? So he can, the, the djinn can wander around as he's trying. So it's basically becomes like a detective movie on two fronts, right? You got the djinn is trying to find the woman who resurrected him. So he can go, give me your three wishes. And she is trying to research what it is that killed her friend who may or may not be boyfriend material. She puts him off at the beginning. And then that's a bad idea, right? Should have took him up on that uh, ball game and hot dog offer. So, yes. okay. So, uh, <laughs> so, so the gin grows into a life-size gin. And so what do we think? So this is the, the full, this is, so we get a, a monster life-size movie. naked gin, Colin. That's right. Well, he you definitely has- see gin ass. Yeah, because uh, well, it's uh, you know, what do you call that? It's a it's a sealed ass, and he has no genitalia because uh, he exactly cheeks. he has you no. Th- 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 that is the exact term. Colin. Believe <laughs> it or not, you nailed it. Sealed ass. Yeah, sealed ass. Got to get some of that sealed ass. Yeah, but I Colin, would. I would argue that there is implied genitalia because he wears clothes for the rest of the movie. That's Just true. To have, like shrouds that he wears and mm-hmm. kind of like armor. It's a little armor. Yeah, I too. thought, see, I thought he had, yeah. Cause this is where I was kind of confused. Cause I thought he had like a, you know, his skin is uh green and scaly, but he had like a red breastplate. Which yeah. He's I, got a chest yeah. plate on. Yeah. Was that but armor? But that doesn't or was come until later. Okay. Yeah. We don't see that when he first grows into the adult gin, he's straight up no. naked at that point. Okay. Yeah. And, naked gin. and then he gets one of those hobo coats. And he actually poses as a homeless person on the streets of L.A. so he can wander around. And, you know, this, uh, you know, thousands of year old deity kind of. Adapts. He fit right in. Yeah. And offers uh, Buck Flower is, uh, you know, how would you like to kill Reggie Bannister, who, you know, won't give you a dollar, kicked you off of the store. And uh, what I, I was kind of disappointed by this. You know, it's like, use your imagination. Yeah. And then he didn't. He's like, I want him to die of cancer. Well, or I want him to get cancer. And to then be die. fair, he doesn't know he's speaking to a gin. That's true. That's very true. Yeah. He doesn't understand what he's saying is going to become reality. Yeah. Yeah, because he had. A is this good... the first time that 
cancer has been weaponized in such a way, I'm going to say. Mm. Kind of, I think so. Like, how do you die in the movie? Instant cancer, and it's gross. Yeah, it feels like a David really Cronenberg gross. movie. It's exactly what you think <laughs> instant cancer would look like. I feel like there's some of that in Dreamcatcher, but it's not as overt. What? The cancer part. The cancer part? Yeah. In Dreamcatcher, it's kind yeah, of Yeah, there's like something that. there, isn't there? Yeah. But. And Reggie Bannister dies in a puddle of goo, so... Uh, Tammy Lauren Alex to her friends uh, who's also a coach of a girls basketball team for you know why is this part scenes. of this movie yeah why, is, why no why is this such a big part of this movie right it adds a dimensionality to the character Sean. stillness stillness I was hoping did, but, shit was going to go down at a basketball game in front of a bunch of people or something you know but how did this happen like generally a basketball coach is also a teacher at the school or at the very least like a parent and she's neither yeah so that is Holly, weird. i think the whole town just takes pity on her because of the the fiery family incident so they're like sure if you want to be the basketball coach maybe like her, maybe her mom was the basketball coach and she died so she took over i, I don't know that's oh oh no i don't know <laughs> well she also has a sister um, who's a party Shannon. animal? I'm not sure what Shannon's up to. Um, but she's there to be bait. Yeah, right. Yeah. She's eventually going to be in peril and uh, will have to be rescued by a wish later Where's on in the movie. Um, so yeah, basically those are the parallel tracks, right? He's trying to track her down, and basically uh, what he's doing is going through just wandering around the city and eventually narrowing in on you know her associates and offering people wishes. Uh, which end up all horribly, right? Um, it's got to charge the gem. Yeah. Well, first of all, what? So, I mean, as far as the uh, the makeup effects on the gin, um, which is shot a lot in close up, right? Yeah. Shooting a lot in close up. Um, how do we? How do we think uh, Pantheon of movie monsters? What do we? What do we think of this? It looks good. Like the quality of it is good, but the styling is so like star trek or power rangers and like i i'm sure that sounds like a slam but it's just like the structure of the face looks like a star trek villain or like a power rangers villain but the quality of it is good yeah it's a good quality i think it's a good looking dude um it kind of reminds me of uh the creeper a lot yeah i think the the makeup looks very similar but i like both those designs so uh, i think it's pretty solid for like a wish demon perfect yeah. yeah, I kind of thought it looked like something that might have been in the movie Legend. It had that, yeah, it had that the feel ten, for me. The, the head and the tentacles, the horns that go back yeah. around his head. And they and move. Like, it's a cool, pretty cool design. The yeah. tentacles move. That was pretty cool. That was yeah. pretty cool. Nice it's little pretty good. He's a good, it. It's a good demon. It's very, it's very charmed. He looks like a charm demon. Yeah. He looks like. Well, this is, a, it's a kind of a funny thing as you chart like makeup effects, uh, designs, you know, it's like now we're like, everything looks like the Cloverfield monster. But I think back then right. it's like everything looked like uh, a Star Trek villain or, you know, whatever, you know, it's uh, big foreheads and high cheekbones. And- yeah. Well, I think they figured out how to make them, uh, make them more. I don't know, either cheaply or being able to more people were mass producing them. So then you just saw masks of the similar type of shit pop up everywhere in productions. Everyone's like, let's yeah, let's put a monster in this and use a mask. So they all end up looking this in. So let me ask you this, because this is, uh, you know, watching it tonight, I think maybe is uh, I think I've seen it since I saw it because I, I saw it in the theater <laughs> opening weekend. And, you know, I must have seen it at least once since then. Um, and then tonight. But I remember, you know, tonight was kind of bringing it back to me. At some point, not too far into the movie, um, the djinn um, goes to a morgue and he steals the face of Andrew Divoff, who's, uh, you know, a corpse, and then morphs into Andrew Divoff and adopts, uh, you know, a suit and tie and wanders. He's got blue contacts, so he looks kind of, you know, the guy has a sinister face. He's got a nice angular, you know, you're going to cast somebody in a horror movie like... 
all right, this guy, you know, he, he's a good villain face, right? That's because, and he's, he, I think going through his life, he's just constantly looking down, but looking directly <laughs> at you. Yeah. And I think that's the key to his evilness. That's that, it's and an animal thing, right? When uh, you, you have that, because uh, Stanley Kubrick employs that all the time. Every time, like, that you death know, stare. yeah, you put your head down and look up through, you know, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like, that, I feel like if this movie was made now, that would be Walton Goggins. Yeah, I mean, he has the. He looks a little good. He he can He's got play the comedy crazy too. Bones and forehead. Yeah, but um, I mean, so Andrew Divoff. I mean, he does look like a sinister motherfucker. Um, you know, but now in a three piece suit, wandering around. Um, would you have preferred the gin in full regalia? Uh, throughout the du- entire duration of the movie, or were you okay with like, oh, now it's a dude walking around uh, I like for the, the rest of the movie? <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I get why they did it because you know, obviously, he wanted to track her down without her seeing directly who he or what he was. So it makes sense. I didn't mind it. Um, no, I didn't mind it. It was all right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it helps him go off and go off and have other adventures with other people yeah. without them seeing that he's a demon. And it, yeah, and it, it helped obviously later on when he, you know, body s- switched to another figure um, because we knew that he could do that. You know, if he hadn't been walking around that character, we wouldn't have known he would have he was able to do that, and it made that part work. And I, I liked that scene. So. I wonder if they right off the bat went looking for an actor to play both. Like they needed someone that they could cast normally and also put on the makeup and act like a demon. I wonder if that was specific when they were looking for it. I assume. Right. I assume. Well, right. Because he was as gonna... much of a bigger role. Well, it's like, you know, because you're saying that it suits the story that he can. But I mean, like if you're in the scripting stage, a story can be anything you want. Right. They decided right. on this avenue. I'm assuming because. You know, you're talking hours of prosthetics and all that stuff, and so you're able to. And yeah, it does give you license to. She, he can then insinuate himself into her life in order to try and track her down. Um, right. So I, it's like I get it, but it does seem like I. I do remember being disappointed that, like, you know, you get this pretty good makeup, you know, and then it's like we're we're basically gonna keep that for the beginning and then at the end and in the middle it's gonna be Andrew Divoff walking around. Uh, looking all freaky um, <clears throat> as he you know, tries to scare people into giving them his wishes. What's uh, so give us maybe a laundry list of um, what are the wishes? How do they go wrong? And uh, what do we got here? When he steals Andrew Divoff's face from the corpse, the, the other kid coming into the, the student of the, the school of medicine says like, Oh, he's like, Oh, what are you doing? I don't want to, like, I don't want to see that or whatever. And he says, uh, do I understand that you wish to not see this? And then he like seals up his eyes with skin. It's pretty cool. That was pretty cool. Yeah. It looks like he's got assholes for eyes at that point. <laughs> Watch what you wish for. What was, uh, uh, the, the one that I, that I was just like, I, I think I was past it by the time that, cause all, that's what he does. Right. He walks up to somebody like Kane Hodder. who's like, I'm not letting you in here. Then engages in a philosophical, a discussion with the guy which is really like you know um no one talks like this no <laughs> no one I, I, it's I very this during the tony todd uh yeah exchange that was like the worst no one's one. gonna stand especially <laughs> especially because it's shot in just two close-ups mm-hmm. you get the feeling that these two have their foreheads together <laughs> While they're talking about this, is like so, so much of this movie is shot that way. Even when like the mm-hmm. two sisters were talking, it was shot like that. It was very strange. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of like floating Dutch angles as they're moving down hallways and stuff. They're really going for like we're going to shoot this weird just to add to the atmosphere of it. Yeah, was it effective? Or was it? It, it was effective it... in uh, being the exact style a movie from this time would have yeah it was a time capsule effect you're like oh i know exactly what era this is <laughs> yeah I, I, uh it kind of feels like everyone saw the same thing and they're just like no we'll do it differently but then it all just ends up being done the same way yeah that's the 90s he goes after he's trying to get into uh to find out like where alexandra lives Alexander, sorry. Um, alexandra. and uh he goes to see her boss in order to do that he's got to get through kane hotter 
Um, you Literally. Know, ha ha. Yeah. Good job, Colin. Yeah, because uh, he's like, what do you wish for? Whatever. And uh, Kane Hodder's like, I want you to leave. And like, no, no, you have to I have to get in there. Kane Hodder's like, eh. I like that. Too. That little turn of like, no, no. <laughs> Don't go. It was good. He's like, I have to get in there. And Kane Hodder's like, yeah, to get in here, you'd have to go through me. And that's something I'd like to see. And then, ha ha, turns around. Kane Hodder turns that's into good. a door. <laughs> glass I'll bet door. That that's a glass wall, basically. Yeah, yeah. and Any yeah, it door. doesn't. It's weird. I guess it had to do with like maybe the effects that they could pull off at the time. Like he walks through him like a bubble, and then he explodes. It's just yeah. he doesn't like. It's weird the way they pulled it off. But what's even weirder is Kane Hodder's look in this movie is a choice. <laughs> it's a choice. <laughs> he has a mullet and like a beard that is shaved at like perfectly like straight angle on his face it's very yeah. strange yeah it's like a, I'm it's always like a lower face people, mask uh beard kind of right? the I'm covid mask people, beard when people have that facial hair that you can cut so finely like that mm-hmm. it's very weird yeah, it's, uh, you spend a, you spend a lot of time making that angle like you you, you worked at that oh yeah it's a thing keep. he goes to see the uh the boss well you know give me your address and she's like no and they're like i'm not comfortable with that what would make you comfortable and uh, the guy wishes for a million dollars so then we cut to a scene of like his mom <laughs> signing uh, him as a beneficiary as she's about to board a flight the plane takes off and explodes it's <laughs> <laughs> the cut is so quick it's like oh i better sign that in case something happens explode See, the, so I, what I was kind of hoping is that like a bank vault would fall on him and kill him or something like a bank vault full of a million dollars or something <laughs> like That's, an like Acme style. Yeah, <laughs> this movie's not above that. No, has uh, some other ones. He buys a, a suit from a woman in uh, somewhere in Beverly Hills. And, you know, wouldn't you like to be beautiful forever? And she's like, yes. And boom, she turns into a mannequin. Um, it's good. I- I like her yeah, eyes rolling up in the back of her head and everything. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, there's like a whole shitload that. Uh, there oh, are. and then the police. He goes to see the 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 cop who's investigating the death of the uh, lab technician. Um, and there, there's a thing where like I wish I could catch that guy like red-handed. There's witnesses everywhere. As you wish, and you know, a guy shoots up the police station. <laughs> so I was like, ha like You got it. <laughs> Um, that must have been the most fun part of writing the script, thinking of the little situations that you could turn mm-hmm. on their head for him. Yeah, yeah, that's I mean, be that's part of the fun of writing and watching this series. Yeah, that's clearly it, and that's uh, why it extended, I guess, through four films. Um, uh, in the meantime, uh, Alex is off trying to research because she's like right away, like I feel that what I brought to bobby whatever his name was lab technician right i brought this opal and then he died i feel like i I am somehow responsible what i brought him killed him so she goes off on a like immediately like it's supernatural this is what killed him and i gotta find out how and that's gonna eventually lead her to um jenny o'rourke right who's the uh, purveyor of knowledge of all things jenny o'hara purveyor of uh, uh middle eastern boogeyman knowledge um she gets replaced at some point by the gen in a scene that um it was interesting because i don't know if it could have been done better but there's the there's a moment where you get the sense that alex becomes aware that the person she's talking to is her adversary yes. right and then but yes. she can't let him know that she knows that you know that I know that you know that I know that you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. This I thought this scene was actually like, I think they did it pretty well. Because um, you know, you have that conversation back and forth. And hopefully around the same time, um, Alex and the audience should be figuring out who the, the, the woman is, you said, the gin at that point. Um, I think it's a good turn. I, I think they pulled it off. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty decent. Then uh, I think that's a, you know, then it becomes like, well, what do you wish? Um, her first wish is uh, I want to, I need to know my adversary. So I want to see who you, what you are. And that takes her, she's transported to the uh, Halloween funhouse uh, lair. 
Yeah. Well, her fir- her first wish, her sample wish, was that he would shoot himself. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. He I gave her a freebie. Blow your brains out. Yeah. He which- becomes very quippy around this time. Which that annoyed me because at first she said, I want you to destroy yourself and then added, I want you to blow your brains. I was like, no, 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 leave it. Destroy yourself. See what happens then. Like, leave Mm -hmm. that. Right. But no, she added, blow your brains out. And it's like, well, nothing's that's not going to work, obviously. And it didn't. I feel like I am so prepared for this situation to happen to me in real life. (laughs) And I'm so disappointed (laughs) that it never will. Like, I feel like I could after seeing this so many times in movies, I feel like I'd ace this at this point. Uh, although i'd like probably the ironclad the, contract for wishes yeah although i probably like the first guy who gets asked the questions three and just gets launched off i probably end up being that guy yeah i, I was frustrated with her saying like i want to know what you are because i feel like you should have said i i want to know what your weakness is right yeah. i want to know how Anything. to destroy you how to because, kill you yeah like, because now she's just asking for his origin story which we don't yeah. need we don't need that yeah tell me how to we tell, saw it already kill you also, right. what did you he, think? You should have just. Oh, okay. Well, what'd you think of the? Because there's another plot device which basically, like the, um, you know, um, uh, teenage basketball team coaching subplot, this also ser- serves to kind of pad out the running time. Is that she uh, experiences much like in Pumpkinhead? And she has a, a she be, she's because she resurrected the gin. She's tied to him psychically, and so she sees. Is she seeing like him killing people? Because that's the impression I get, but she none of that knowledge factors into any of her decision making. She never mentions it aloud. But like we are every time he kills somebody, we cut to her face going, oh, or she like, I lost track of what I was talking about. Or she's waking up screaming in the middle of the night. Like, what does that have to do with anything? Mm-hmm. Don't know. I don't know. I think yeah, it definitely he- looks like she feels it. Because he's he's not in her head, is he? Like he, any other time he's not. He can't yeah, he doesn't know where she is. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't know where she is. So they're like, they're not connected. So why is she seeing that? It, it doesn't really make any sense. If he doesn't know where she is, why does he, how is he able to resort to the old, uh, well, I was going to say obscene phone call, the stalker phone call <laughs> thing. Yeah. He starts calling her on the phone and yeah. giving her the. <laughs> this all wait, powerful wait, what game. kind of phone? Use his phone. Oh, yeah. It's a Pacific Bell, the biggest fucking product placement in this movie. My God. They had a pay The phone. whole phone booth. Phone booth. And then, they, like, yeah, when her phone's ringing, they do a real fast, like, zoom in on that logo before she picks it up. Yep. It's Bell. Uh, Alexandra, I am coming for you. Um, yeah, I don't get the point of all that. I decided to elevate her stress level. But she doesn't know who it is or what until she meets him face to face, disguised as the uh, the the purveyor, the aforementioned purveyor. Um, so her second wish then is uh, because he's like your you've left your sister unguarded. So she jumps. You know, second wish is she wants to go back to her apartment, and uh, then it turns out that sister has gone to a party hosted by Robert Englund, who was the guy who I think we said was bringing the giant statue over to America and it was broken. So he lost his pre- uh, precious treasured piece of his collection. Um, and so the gin approaches Robert Englund at the party. And so then this becomes like, you know, if you could have a wish, what would it be? And he says, um, what, what is it? He wants to have a party like, uh, you know, something that would go down in history. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. A store party, a memorable party. And so for our climax, we unleash another special effects uh, crowd catastrophe. Um, but how did you think that this one stacked up against the first one? Because I think the rule is if you start with one, I get the, the rhyme, the symmetry of ending the movie with a similar thing in the modern day right a party where mm-hmm. shit goes crazy and you know guts are strangling people and uh we got a director cameo getting attacked by a piano wire and there's all sorts of cg snakes and shit and walking statues and all this but you have to do it better than the first one right first one's the setup then you land it at the end it's like a joke right that's the punchline. does this yeah. movie accomplish that would you give it that credit well, real quick, I'm pretty sure Robert England says something to the effect of like, oh, I'd kill to have a party like that or something mm, like mm, that. Mm, mm. And because there's always got to be like a euphemism in there that he can manipulate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That he can turn mm-hmm. to wink at the camera with. <laughs> 
Well, did you dig this? I mean, was it better than the first uh, first time around? I think it was as good. Yes. There's yeah, a lot to better. dig. There's a lot to dig in this. There's the uh, yeah. the statues and everything, which I liked a lot. I thought that yeah, they all looked really say, good. I was going to say, I really liked that aspect because, I mean, the guy is <sighs> is uh, a, hist- a history buff. So he's got all of these like artifacts in his house. So you're literally watching like Jack the Ripper walk out of a painting and Attila the Hun come to life. And I'm like, that's pretty awesome. Terracotta warriors. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And a lot of like I d- uh, I dug Greco-Roman that. That was cool. sculptures coming to life. Those are pretty good Samurais, effects. Samurais. Yeah. Iron, yeah. iron statues. It's pretty good. I thought they looked pretty good. It Duck reminded me of something in like, waxwork. Yeah, yeah. 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 Where it's just here we're going with uh, full throttle makeup effects, floor effects. Because, you know, I mean, when are we going to get to do this again? Or the tide is shifting to CG. We're going to go out with a big bang. Because this is yeah. after From Dusk Till Dawn, even which those guys worked on, can be worked on From Dusk Till Dawn, but that was like a big practical effects uh, mm-hmm. movie. Um, but uh, so with their third wish, actually, this is one of the things I remembered about the movie. Uh, she is kind of clever in her solution to all this, maybe because she took her own advice, Sean, and she uh, took that stillness. It was just stillness. her and the gym. Her and stillness. the gym. Stillness. <laughs> And she considered Stones. what was going on. And we, of course, in the nineties, he had to do all these fucking flash Stones. frames to, you know, as she realizes, as she looks back at reading the newspaper <coughs> of the, uh, the incident at the dock. Um, yeah, but she comes up with the idea that, Hey, if Joe Pilato wasn't drinking that day. Uh, you know, none of this would have happened. So I... that's, that's a pretty good wish though. That's yeah. good. That's a good way out. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is the moral tale, I guess, right? It's like you can never, the whole idea is that basically you're going to get three wishes, scot-free. You get to have whatever the, your heart's desire. That never works out. It's always no. a bad, bad thing. So Sean asking for it. That's no, Sean. You haven't learned your lesson from watching all these movies. You're not going to ace it. You think you are. <laughs> that's going to get you. That's what it does. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I, did you say something? Something just went through. <laughs> 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 and your last wish has to be to reverse everything. So it's a temporary thing. You have to reverse everything by your last wish uh, if yeah. you survive. So, yes. yeah, but that was a pretty good. I thought that was a pretty good ending. Does she remember uh, the events of the movie at the end of the movie when, when time resets? Yes. She does. How do we know? Because the, her her best friend that dies the lab the lab guy that dies at the beginning her best friend the one that's been asking her out forever she finally is like asking him out because she knows what the outcome could have been that she could have lost him forever so now she's you know realizing what what's right in front of her kind of situation yeah. that doesn't mean you got to marry the guy. No, but it's uh, the the she's hope just agreeing of, to a date instead of a hot yeah. dog baseball. That's, that's very true. That's very true. <laughs> yeah, and it's hope, right? That's uh, the hope of uh, a blossoming relationship, and who knows where it'll go. And take the chance because life is short. You no know, horror movies. I'm telling you, life lessons. But that gin, <laughs> that little that uh, ruby, that sorry, the opal is some still buried inside. But that's the thing because I was sitting there going like, well, f- won't somebody else find it? Is she worried about that? Wouldn't you be terrified if you remembered that all this happened? You're like, oh my god, that thing is still out in the world, and someone's gonna find it at some point. This is the sequel. Mm-hmm. Well, Should but be. it's in Robert England's <laughs> house, like basically in a museum right now. So right. yeah. what better inside- place for it? Yeah, it's inside of a statue that he has no intention of breaking into. So. Yeah, well, I, that but that was the thing, I think, when we actually see it. It's like, oh, it's buried inside the center of the statue in case it's so no yeah. one would ever know that it was there unless you broke the fucking thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Have, have you seen part two? Nope. Have you? <laughs> uh, I know how to get the opal out of the statue. Oh. I've heard about it? a couple things that happened in that movie. And we're I think it, I think it gets it shot it. in a robbery. And so it comes out and it gets found. Oh. Uh, Speaking of Benjamin I've, Button, there's a guy in that movie that says, I wish he had been born and reverse Benjamin Buttons until he dies. Nice. <laughs> nice. I've heard about like the guy. I had a callback to 30 minutes ago. <laughs> Isn't there a guy also in the second one who, well, we'll talk about it. It's in the mailbag. So, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, that's uh, any fleeting final thoughts on uh, Wishmaster before we uh, give it our review? So, that lizard man in like the. The opening scene, there's like a guy that's like half lizard. Yeah. Do you think that was special effects or do you think that was one of those people that like gets mods to look like a lizard? I think it was a makeup. I think it was, uh, I think it was makeup. makeup. Yeah. 
The way it moved, it was, I mean, it was solid, but you could, it, it, I feel like if it was CGI, they would have had it slither more. No, I'm not saying CGI. I'm saying like, you know, those people that like get surgery to look like lizards or like cat people. Yeah. I'm saying, do you think it was one of those people that like they put extra appliances on? Oh, do we know this? I don't know. know. Um, One of those people from haunt. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It kind of looked like some, it looked so convincing. I was like, maybe it is one of those lizard people. Mm. That was Maybe. Good, good, good makeup know. effects. I mean, that's what I was thinking was, um, you know, that I, I often wonder a lot of times when these guys are called in to do like this big, I mean, basically it's in the family thing, right? It's a makeup guy who runs a makeup studio making a movie. Do they just go through like the closet and find all the stuff that they haven't used in other stuff or that they made, you know, on their own? And we're just going to sure throw it all in there? Or is all this stuff generated for the movie? I think it does. What the I'm showing hell? A picture. This is what I'm talking about. This is like the lizard guy. The guy that's uh, like okay. all these tattoos and procedures to look like a lizard. This is what I'm saying. Like, do you think it was someone like this and they just like put some body appliances on them? Right. Like, yeah. uh, you could cut the work down a lot, you know? Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, so looking for alligator people. Please apply with that. Yeah. I mean, it's happened. <laughs> like- it's possible. No, it's definitely possible. That guy's got a, the guy Michael is showing us has, has surgically bisected his tongue, which is probably not a wise move, uh, folks out there, but uh, hey, to each his own, I guess. <laughs> you want to <laughs> go make yourself look like a lizard? You can. God bless America. Um, so uh, now we're going to, uh, well, this isn't the most exciting part of the show. This is the setup for the most part, exciting part of the show. We're going to read some of your mail. In order to do that, ladies and germs, we're going to have to summon the help of our mailman, Igor, who's going to bring us our mail. Igor, bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. I had to pl- uh, plank to get that clap off, so. <laughs> I do not think that uh, any of uh, Igor's modifications were done willingly. I think those are done to keep them together, to tell you the <laughs> truth. <laughs> yeah, they're not by choice. It's like no, those are definitely uh, for quote-unquote health reasons. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, we want to let you know how you can uh, participate in the Saturday Night Freak Show experience. All you got to do is go over to our Facebook page. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Or follow us on Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. Maybe you'd like to email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. Or you can follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. MF Mad, the keeper of the Wall of Fame, informs us that three people from this movie, because it's a horror movie, all star uh, ensemble, um, have finally made it. That we thought probably we're already on the wall, but he says uh, Tom Savini, right, who we have talked about at length for his makeup effects work and some stuff, but as an actor, uh, apparently he was in tonight's movie. He was a pharmacy customer, which I think I remember him like in that shot where the Reggie Bannister's on the ground and we're his point of view looking up. I think maybe that's Tom Savini. Uh, I'm F. Mad says it is. Yeah, I can see that. Because uh, he looks like he's in the leather jacket and you know, he looks like uh, the Daughter of the Dead character. But uh, so he was in this. He was also in Creep Show. He was the garbage man in Creep Show. And he was in the Dawn of the Dead remake as the county sheriff. So we've done three movies uh, with Tom Savini as an actor. We've also bringing tony todd to the uh saturday night free show wall of fame because obviously he was in candy man uh he is here in wishmaster and he was also the voice of death in final destination three so there you go and uh finally angus scrim uh Yay. the tall man from phantasm which we did phantasm we did wishmaster where he was the narrator and uh he was also dr carrington in the movie Chopping Mall. If you remember Chopping Mall, we did Chopping Mall. So there you go. Those three Tom Savini, Tony Todd, and Angus Scrim, all Titans in the horror. That's a good class. Yeah. Yeah. All inducted. Graduating class. Because of Wishmaster. (laughs) So there you go. We will send your certificates out to you, um, surviving. Okay. Uh, They're on the pile. Igor's in charge of it. That's right. (laughs) Get on that, Igor. Uh, So about tonight's movie, Monty Montague writes in and says, How is it taking this long? 
a good question. Yeah, I was shocked. I, I was shocked I honest, it hadn't already come. I honestly thought question. we already did it. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, Ed Snyder says, Wishmaster is a film I saw with my buddies in the theater on opening night back in 97. Needless to say, we were the only ones there, but that didn't stop me from returning to a second showing later that weekend, this time with three <laughs> other people in the theater. It's always wow. been a fun genre-filled guessing game of who's who in the community. It was the death house of the 90s. Nice. Absolutely. Yep. I haven't seen Death House. How's Death House? It's bad. Okay, but it has like all the horror. Uh, it's like people. Kane Hodder, Linnea Quigley, like all those types. It was it was being billed literally as the Expendables of horror. Like that was how they tried to sell it, and it was one of those things that like there was a Kickstarter for, and it was in production hell for a long time. It was like a fan backed thing. It's it's not really worth checking out. Yeah, that's why you got to go with Wishmaster when that stuff actually mattered. Uh, <laughs> you know, the theatrical releases <laughs> from live entertainment comes Wishmaster. Um, Travis Legler says this movie is a lot of fun and can be a little goofy whenever i hear this title i think of the second movie which takes place in a prison the wishmaster grants the wish of a prisoner for his lawyer to go fuck himself of course this happens right after the lawyer tells the prisoner he can't get him out of jail so the scene makes me laugh every time so there you go that's what you got wishmaster 2 go fuck yourself it's a scene. very it's... memorable scene <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh we should say it doesn't uh, really make sense but it happens well there you go uh in case you've ever wanted to see that there you go fulfilled in wishmaster 2 andrew divoff uh, he played the wishmaster in wishmaster 1 and 2 and another actor whose name uh, escapes me played him in 3 and 4 uh jacob laws says i'm not gonna lie this is a guilty pleasure i think the design of the gin was pretty cool and is up there with freddy pinhead and leprechaun for horror villain makeup designs it's pretty solid yeah, B-team. well executed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Michael Whitaker says, Genie or rejected Star Trek Next Generation Alien, you decide. Props to the truly underrated Ted Raimi for being in this movie. He deserved more screen time, and I still can't wrap my mind around the fact that this spawned three sequels. Uh, Stephen Hayes says, uh, this was just a hell of a lot of fun and one of the better 90s movies that is still very underrated. Uh, Nelson Nascimento writes in says this was a franchise that should have been a more popular and could have been so much better had the proper money had been funneled into the budget. I love the first and the second one due to div off and some great if special effects. Jack Shoulders took over for part two, much like Nightmare on Elm Street, and the franchise almost seemed to be following Freddy's footsteps. Unfortunately, there would be no Dream Warriors here. I, I'm hearing more and more reasons to to watch part two. <laughs> <laughs> Jack part two was the one I remember being pretty memorable. It was pretty good. But again, it's been a long time since I've seen it. Yeah, it came up on Amazon Prime where we watched this. It was like, up next. They're all Wish on Master, there, aren't All they? four of them, yeah. So you can all have four a, of them are on there, Michaela. Have a Wishmaster weekend. <laughs> uh, a whole week off coming up. Hmm. That's right. Grant Parrish says, this is a great movie, and I'll tell you why. The inciting incident to the film involves a giant crate crushing Ted Raimi to death, and it is glorious. The ending is a bit sad for me for reasons that I think are obvious from this comment. Love you guys. Uh I always forget about his hate boner for Ted Raimi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Gary Lee says, this is one of my hate favorites. Boner. And uh, the sequel is even better slash worse. The third and fourth are wet garbage. Andrew Divoff carries this movie um last week we watched a movie called night killer carl sandell says hello freak showers you guys keep proving to be the best curators of film well that's a Oh, that's wow. a high compliment. That's high Thank praise. You. That Thank is high you. praise. Uh, Carl says you have to love a weird ass <laughs> plot getting explained by a twist that makes it so much weirder, but the movie plays it like a happy ending. Night killer. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm Jake, still recovering from that movie. I think. It's so weird. That's got to go on an annual movie watch list. It's like, yeah, this is two uh, two movies in a row. We've had Star Trek villains. As our main bad guys, so <laughs> profit us. Yeah, and uh, Jacob Cotner says that movie is rid- goddamn ridiculous. Yes, Spelled it is. Yeah, R I G O D C A M N D I C U. Uh, Colin. <laughs> <Goddamn ridiculous. laughs> yeah. All right. So again, thank you everybody for writing in. Um, yeah, thank you. 
So, uh, and everybody, uh, thank you for uh, writing in and wishing us Halloween uh, last week. Uh, we oh, got yeah. a couple of photos. Everybody's wearing the T-shirt and uh, out with their kids. It's great stuff. Uh, we love to see it. It's fantastic. I hope you had a happy and safe Halloween also. Spooky Halloween. <laughs> now we're on our way to spooky thanks. Giving. Um, blood rage. Blood rage. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Helen, is there something else we'd like to uh, run by the listeners real quick before we move on to the next segment? I think so. Um, our our uh, end of the year episode this year? Uh, Probably going to look a little different, right? As yeah, we try to figure sure. out, because you know, we usually we do a best and worst of the year for uh, our New Year's episode. But this year, we're going to have to come up with something else. Yeah. So think yeah, about your, a- like high school superlatives, you know, think about those <laughs> kinds of things. And if you guys have suggestions, best we'd love smile. To hear them. <laughs> what's your best smile movie? <laughs> no, we're looking. Usually we do our at the end of every year, we do our best and worst of the year. Five best, one worst. Uh, this year, obviously, has been a little bit more difficult with uh, uh, things happening in the world and all that. So what we decided or what we're trying to decide on is what categories you want us to cover for our right. end of the year wrap up. And like right. Michaela said, we want your superlatives. What were we thinking? We, were, we went through a lot of things in the chat. We were yeah. talking about like yeah, the favorite TV show you binge this year or something right. old that you rediscovered your love for. So Or the first, yeah, maybe a yeah. horror movie that has been uh, existed for 30 years, but we saw it for the first time this year. Mm-hmm. Maybe we've done that for a bunch. What's our favorite one of those? Things we discovered, stuff like right. that. We yeah. talked to, we, yeah, we, we talked about like our our favorite uh, movie that we watched on the freak show this year or mm. our um uh like uh, you said we uh shall we binge watch or we could we could still do what was the thing that was most disappointing to us this year and i don't i mean like i mean tv and movies i don't mean anything else <laughs> oh yeah, this okay. isn't a therapy i got a list <laughs> we're but yeah but we are we are including tv in this now because you know not a lot of movies came out in theaters this year so uh, we didn't get a lot of 2020 content to go off of. So if you want us to hear what we binge watched or like a favorite TV show, we can do that too, you know, because mm-hmm. everyone's watching lots of content on Netflix and Prime. So whatever yeah, we, you think, this is this is the yearbook episode. Right. We'd still probably like to keep it to five or six things. Um, right. Well, I'd yeah. say, I'd yeah. say well, yeah, five, I think five categories we'll pin down yeah. and the sixth one, we'll still do the worst, our worst thing oh, this yeah. year. But yeah, let us know. Colin, I mean, I guess uh, Colin's, Colin's like, I got like, that. Colin's like, I have 10 worst things. This yeah. sucks. That's right. Cause I've been keeping current on the movies. I, I think I've seen most of the, the, I don't that's know, true. Some major stuff that's come out. I'm not sure. I mean, everything's all over a hundred different See, I don't platforms. I don't even know now, like so. what major stuff's come out. It's just so yeah. same. bizarre. Yeah. Like, yeah, they, you got, know? they got an year end list. We'll come up with something, but yeah, send us your suggestions. Cause uh, we're all ears and trying to nail down the format for that episode uh now we're gonna go around the room and uh, review tonight's movie wishmaster <laughs> i feel like yelling uh colin what did you think of tonight's movie wishmaster 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 spice <laughs> what is your <laughs> wish um i don't know i'm on the fence about this one i mean i i gotta tell you i did have a, a more positive experience watching it tonight than i did the last time i saw it you know i saw it during the era when it when it came out and it was like the plot was not terribly engaging i was disappointed by the fact that you know duder wasn't a monster for the whole thing um i was turned off by the really bad special effects the cg because this is a movie that employs that uh, it's like the warped mirror or the liquid pool, you know, where they just kind of turn a photographic background into like, you know, a mirror, yeah. a floating mirror surface or some kind of, you know, undulating liquid thing. And I, I hate it all, especially all the, all the uniformly, all the, uh, the CG look cheesy, bad and cheap. Um, the practical effects though, stood out more to me this time because I think, uh, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, <laughs> you know, when you're living mm-hmm. in an era where you're kind of deprived of that, it's like, you know, sucking in oxygen when it's like, Oh man, look at those guys are shooting for the moon there. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. And, uh, um, I, I almost think that like I had such a good time with them, you know, cause obviously this is a movie that's built to showcase 
special effects, right? The, the reason it exists, the reason you have a special effects guy directing it is all, everything else is almost secondary. These are all setups, uh, little vignettes that set up makeup effects, uh, you know, and for that reason, I think I'm going to recommend it um, because I didn't like hate the movie. It wasn't, you know, boring. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. It wasn't really funny. Um, but I enjoyed the makeup effects work and the, the spirit of, you know, all this, you know, having all these famous horror people show up, you know, it's like old friends, like, Oh shit, it's so-and-so and oh, yeah, it's you. And there's you, you know? Um, so I think for, for those two reasons, makeup effects and, uh, you know, getting all the horror folks together in one movie, I like that better than, you know, hatchet you know did stuff like you know now the, these guys appear in movies all the time and they were back then even a lot of uh it's kind of a trend it feels like maybe uh john landis or something started right where he would have famous people uh mostly directors or whatever appear in his movies in little bit parts and then you know by the time he got to like sleepwalkers you know mick garris was casting a bunch of uh, familiar faces in there um this is like an extension with that where we got like the legit guys from all these low budget horror movies to uh all contribute to one movie um is there anybody who's left out there that uh you know you, uh, uh, i mean warwick davis doesn't show up they should have warwick davis instead of uh, uh Vern instead of, yeah instead of mini me yeah yeah and it would have been oh, the leprechaun too he's even in this um so yeah it's uh, uh i i think yeah it's a you got to check out Wish, wishmaster it's fun and uh full of full of gory gooey goopy makeup effects so um let's go with uh sean Wishmaster. Um, <clears throat> it's been a long time since I've seen this one. Um, and so uh, it was nice to get that refresher because I completely forgot about the, like you said, Holly, the smorgasbord of of just effects at the beginning and, and near the end of this movie. Um, they really are incredible. And it was like, I was a little slack jawed when that um, skeleton popped out of that body. I was just like, this is awesome. Cool. That's what I came for. Um, I forgot it was in this movie. Um, this movie is, I'm going to say this movie is fun enough. Like uh, I think like Colin said, it doesn't, it's not going to blow you away, but it's a good enough movie. Like it really is the solid B team horror, especially like through the nineties and early two thousands and stuff uh, of that era. Um, it's still pretty decent. Um, it gives you enough. It's, it's playful enough. Um, you know, and then it's also the kind of movie where you're just like, I could see them like there's potential in it as well, which, you know, you uh, get in the sequels. I, I don't know what, to what degree I think I've only seen the second one. Um, but it is, uh, it's, it's a fun enough movie. It's definitely cheesy. Um, the main actress, um, uh, anything I've seen her in, she's been very, she's very over the top. Um, uh, she gets a little so in this movie, um, but everybody seems like they're having fun. Um, Devoff seems like he's having fun. I like him as the demon and even the human character. Um, yeah, it's it's good enough. It's good enough. You should watch it. I mean, it's Wishmaster. It's kind of been around forever, and I, if it's one of those movies where you're like, "Damn, Wishmaster! I haven't seen that movie, or I haven't watched that in forever." It's that movie, so I think you should go back and revisit it. Um, so yeah, that's a recommend for me on Wishmaster. Is this a, uh, well, real quick, is this a, uh, this was like one of them Vestron four packs, right? They just put it out on Blu-ray, the whole set, I right? think so, yeah. Like yeah, Warlock yeah. and Waxwork and all that. They put out like the four yeah. Wishmasters. Yeah, so you can get it, yes. the whole set. There I you go. Um, so I thought that I had seen this, but I don't think I have. I, I thought that I had seen this back in the 90s, but yeah, I don't remember any of it. I really don't think I actually watched this movie. And watching it tonight... I I have to say I'm surprised that it's not talked about more. I really am because it gave you it gave me everything I wanted. Like, you know, it's not going to you know, it's not going to blow your mind like like Sean said. It, it's it's not going to give you um horror content that's just going to like stay with you forever, but I I I don't know. It might though because honestly like that that beginning scene was fucking awesome. There was so much going on in just a few minutes, and it was just, it was amazing. I truly think it was one of those situations where it was like, 
he just like they just had a notebook of all the little all the little details they've always wanted to try and this was their shot to try it all and i mm. thought that was so cool like i could just see I, I literally felt like I could just see a notebook of like all of these things, like page after page, like snake guy and like tree head. And I was like, that's so awesome. I thought it was really fun. Um, and then shockingly enough, it held up throughout the movie enough that like it kept my interest. I, yeah, the plot might've slowed down a little bit, but there was enough happening that I was never bored with this movie. Um, I, I think the, the, the gin is a fantastic design. I think it's really great. Um, it, it it worked for me for sure um you know colin now that you brought up like do you wish that we would have had it the whole time at the time i was like no i don't mind but now looking back on it i kind of wish we would have had more of it um just because it is such a cool design i do like that it was a progressive design that it started in one form and it ended in like the ultimate gin form that was pretty cool um yeah, I thought this was fun. The gore was great. Um, obviously, the acting is not going to be anything you're going to you know, write home about. It's not a remarkably written movie or anything like that. But it's interesting enough that it does stay, it, it does keep you with the movie the entire time. It was entertaining as hell. Um, and obviously, we've gone on and on about how fun it is just to have like the horror family show up. You know, just everyone is in this movie. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's solid. I'm really surprised this isn't talked about more. I think it's a fun movie, and I definitely recommend it for sure. I think it should be in your in your uh, back pocket anytime you need a, a fun, gory, satisfying horror movie. You know, um, I do agree. The CGI is terrible, and it's really distracting to see that next to good practical effects. It makes mm -hmm. it even more obvious, and that's really irritating. But it's also 1997, so I totally expected that to happen. You know, it's just one of those things. Um, but yeah, that's really, I can't really say much negative about it. I thought it was fun. I definitely recommend it for sure. It's a good time. Michaela, bring us home. Yeah, this is my first time actually watching this. I'd heard a lot about the movie, but I don't think I really knew what it was about. And I think the title is kind of a little misleading and might even turn people off because I think it sounds kind of like whimsical and magical and more kind of yeah, like, like page master. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. I was like, is this going to be like a page master, never ending story kind of shit? Right? Yeah. yeah. You, you want to not... watch, watch Wishmaster? What, the Matt Cole, you called your piece of shit? No. <laughs> yeah. It's not a, not a great title for uh, like a horror franchise, you know? Um, but it, there was way more carnage and gore in this movie than I ever could have expected. Uh, definitely see a lot of shared DNA and similarities with the Hellraiser movies, but that franchise dips off so quickly that to me, I think I'd rather go the Wishmaster route, but we'll see. Um, yeah, the, the effects are great. Uh, the the gore is awesome. Is the story the greatest? Not really. But this is kind of like how like Final Destination, the gimmick is you're like you're looking to see the mousetrap of how they're going to kill someone. This right. one, you're looking to find out how he's going to like take their words literally. You know, yeah. that's the whole point of the franchise is seeing how he interprets like euphemisms and stuff like that. Um, and so I definitely think you got to watch it. I mean, I'm really like, I've had a lot of same feelings about this. That I had about pumpkin head. Like, why is nobody watching this? Why is nobody talking about it? I feel like maybe no one's just really seen it. Like, or I guess they completely forget, or maybe they only think of the second one, but, uh, Divoff is great, uh, both in makeup and out of it. He's awesome. Uh, it's great to just see all your, like Colin said, it's good to see all your old horror friends. Like I literally gasped when, when Reggie walked on screen because I didn't know he was in this. So I was like, oh, oh my God, like someone else remembers Phantasm, you know? Um, and he had like quite a scene, like he got a cool death and like, I, cause I thought he was going to like walk in, talk to the homeless guy and walk out and that was going to be it. So I was mm -hmm. excited to see he got a little bit more than that. But yeah, it's, it's got a lot of good stuff here. A lot of fun stuff. I think it would be like a really fun, like drive in or like a midnight movie kind of watch. And I'm kind of surprised that like, especially with how ridiculous the second one sounds that these two aren't done together a lot more. Um, I, what is it about this movie that everyone just forgets about it? Like, <laughs> is that yeah. part of the gin powers? Is you just forget <laughs> about this movie after you see it? Like, well, I, I mean, I mean, we talked about how it, it, it did well. You said what it made, like it made 10 million, right? 15. So three times oh, its budget. Right. So, but it did come out at a really weird, awkward time in horror. Right. 
Like everything the 90s. surrounding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but even so, the late 90s. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like thinking about all the all the stuff that we've watched on just on our show from the late 90s, it's it's really remarkable that this came out with all those other things. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. You know. But yeah. yeah. Maybe got caught in the glut and some shit. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, but definitely got to check out Wishmaster. I'm excited to check out the sequel and hopefully bring it someday because it definitely sounds like they take like the the literal dialogue even more literally in the next movie. So I'm excited for that. So like, definitely watch Wishmaster. Was this a first time watch for you, Michaela, tonight? Yeah, it was. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Like I thought it was it was like Holly. I thought I had seen it, but I think I was thinking of a different movie. Hmm. Wait, you you brought the movie thinking it was a different movie? No, like I was like, oh, I know what that movie is. And I was like, oh, no, this isn't at all what I thought it was. Oh, you know, right. but no, I'd never actually like I think I've maybe seen parts of it, but I'd never actually given it an honest watch before. All right. Well, we'll have to see. Well, I guess it's a freak show approved, right? That was four yeses yeah. uh, for Wishmaster. Yep. Uh, can next- we can we uh, can we adopt the opposite of Rotten Tomatoes? Like if we all agree on it, it's a rotten movie. <laughs> I don't think that I think that's a pretty good idea. And just like, all right, four approved. That's a rotten freak show recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> well, next week uh, we're going to be watching a movie that's chosen by Colin. It's it's the food it's the food season, Colin. What are we watching next hey, week? Don't disappoint me. A movie to turn you off ever eating again. Have you guys seen oh, no. From Beyond? I don't I think, think so. so. I don't think I've. I don't think I've officially seen From Beyond. Okay. Well, there you go. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Now that you say that, I don't know. So we're bringing. I'm going to say no. Stuart Gordon back. I don't know how many Stuart Gordon movies that we've done on the free show. I'm going to count them up, and uh, this is like two movies in a row. I'm <laughs> choosing this is an on accident and eight based on an H.P. Lovecraft story. So oh, on accident, bullshit. <laughs> yeah, it was. I no, I was like, I went from right beyond. Now. I'm like, oh, I just did uh, Haunted. This, Bath. Yeah, yeah. This is this is on my list though, Colin, of things that I was looking into bringing. Okay, well there yeah, you go. I, Cross I got it off. floating around a lot, and I want to watch it all right well then you get your chance uh next week from beyond on the saturday night freak show and until then ladies and ghouls the wait boils and ghouls there you go <laughs> the what'd, you call, what'd you call me <laughs> the is going dark <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>